Our focus today is on the series of Watch, Pray, Be Ready. And specifically, enduring through lawlessness and confusion. In this particular series, earlier in the year, we already had a message that focused on endurance, endurance through betrayal and hatred. But today, looking at it from a slightly different perspective. Jumping right into Matthew chapter 24, we remind ourselves of Jesus' words. That they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Pausing for just a moment to ask technical to please take away the echo if that is possible. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Now, I know that these words are familiar to almost all of us, but let's think about those most salient words, those most salient points that Jesus is making. According to Jesus, the gospel continues to go forward through tribulation and persecution, goes forward through even martyrdom killing. And of course, this has been applicable in many generations since Jesus initially articulated these words, even in the generation of that first century. This was true. And it has been true in many other generations as well. And it is especially applicable to our generation today. According to Jesus, the gospel continues to go forward through lawlessness and through love that has gone cold. The gospel goes forward all the way through to the end. So we are assured we can be certain of these things. There will be tribulation. There will be persecution. There will be hatred. There will be lawlessness. Love will continue to grow cold, and the gospel will be proclaimed. All of that is certain. That is assured. What is not assured, what is not certain, what is a variable, is my endurance and yours. Will we endure through all of that? So today, enduring through lawlessness and confusion. Three current issues more specifically frame our thinking today. Violence and heartlessness, the Supreme Court of the United States' recent action in overturning Roe v. Wade, and the voices of the LGBTQ community. Now you look at those things on the screen and you listen to what I have just said. And you're already going, oh, wow, what is he going to say? And I realize that this message has the potential to be, I might say, concerning or even offensive to some. But in all of it, it is presented because of what we find in the Bible. Let's look first at what is happening currently with violence and heartlessness. Of course, the war with Russia and Ukraine continues to go on. Just this week, earlier this week, headline came, Russia bombs shopping mall in Kremenchuk, Ukraine. It is estimated that 1,000 shoppers were present in the mall when this bombing took place. At the time this article was pinned, 18 were dead, 36 were missing, 58 injured. What national entity would bomb a civilian shopping mall? 
Of course, the term war crimes is associated with this action. Not all that long ago, in other parts of the world, South Africa, there were over 100 deaths in ongoing violence with those of Indian origin as South African take up arms to defend themselves. It's not just Russia and Ukraine, it's in other parts of the globe as well. Again, not all that long ago, in Myanmar, soldiers tell of rapes and mass burials, of orders that they were given to kill all that you see. As we come back closer to home, just this week, I was talking with one earlier today about the tragedy that occurred outside of San Antonio, Texas. 50 migrants die in an abandoned trailer tractor on a remote road in sweltering San Antonio, Texas heat. That was the number at the time this particular article was penned. I think that number has risen now to 53. In New York, this week, woman shot on Upper East Side from point blank range, just blocks from New York City's mayor's mansion. These are just the headlines from this week and from recent years. Violence is an ongoing phenomena. It is an ongoing issue. The love of many growing cold is an application of what we see in the headlines. Drug traffickers arrested in California with 150,000 fentanyl pills. But they were released just days later. We read things like this and we go, what? And of course, domestic violence is an ongoing tragedy, often not talked about until there is a tragic end of life. And by the way, looking back at that story from New York, it is believed that that was now an act of domestic violence as the shooter had been in some type of a relationship with the woman that he shot. Let's transition now to the Supreme Court of the United States action in regards to abortion. Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually had an intuition that this could be a possibility. When Roe v. Wade was actually formulated back in 1973, she was not fond of how that decision came to be. It was on shaky constitutional grounds as far as she was concerned. She didn't like how it was structured. The way that Justice Ginsburg saw it, Roe v. Wade was focused on the wrong argument, that restricting access to abortion violated a woman's privacy. She would rather that it had been based on the idea that it would affect gender equality. And she had an intuition that at some point in the future, this would be challenged. From 1992, she gave a lecture in which she gave this little soundbite. Doctrinal limbs too swiftly shaped may prove unstable. And of course, with the case that arose out of Mississippi, bringing the issue back to the Supreme Court, that true proved to be a fulfillment. Now, we know that abortion is a highly contentious issue, divisive. For the last 49 years, many in our country have come to believe that it is a constitutional right but there are others, on the other hand, that say, no, it is not a constitutional right. Voices are loud. They are strident on both sides. Also, not in culture generally, but even within the Adventist community. The figures that you see here are both a part of the Seventh-day Adventist community. On the left is Sheila Jackson Lee, congresswoman from Houston, Texas. She is pro-choice. On the right is Dr. Ben Carson. High-profile, well-known Seventh-day Adventist. He is decidedly pro-life. And I would imagine that within this sanctuary right now, there is a spectrum of views upon this. There are those that are pro-choice, 
and there are those that are pro-life. It's interesting to me that this response to the overturning of Roe v. Wade brought about a violent reaction among many. If abortions are not safe, you are not either. Now, what I find ironic that this particular graffiti and vandalism occurred in Vermont, which is a decidedly pro-choice state. So what is the use of defacing property in a state that is already pro-choice? But it doesn't matter because the reactions are so emotional. If you have looked at this issue at all with any type of depth, you'll realize that there are two very divergent ground-level assumptions. The rights of the unborn versus the rights of the mother. The idea that the unborn is a human being versus the idea <clears throat> that the unborn is not a human being. It is simply a product of conception. It is a clump of cells. Facebook and other aspects of social media have become forums of conversation. And just on a personal note, this is why I never personally discuss sensitive issues on social media or even in emails. Even when there is a contentious issue arising on a personal basis, I do not respond with any type of substantive message in email. It's always with a telephone call or face to face. These two rather graphically blank statements came from friends of ours. <laughs> they posted them on Facebook in response to other things that have been posted on Facebook. These are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, at least when we knew them, they were. One said in response to the overturn of Roe v. Wade, I want to live in a secular country. Now, that implies all sorts of things that leave one up to interpretation. What exactly do you mean? Generally, you would think that that is implying that I don't agree with the perceived religious perspective of pro-life. Her spouse said, in a conversation with those who were commenting, he said, my belief system is no longer bound to the Bible. This is an individual who grew up in a minister's home, who is a medical doctor, who has brothers in ministry, a highly intelligent individual. I didn't know him to have this perspective 10 years ago. But he has, well, maybe he didn't mourn. Maybe this was always a part of his of his mental and emotional processing of what he perceives to be reality. Now, my belief system is bound to the Bible. And I'm assuming that most of us here in this room would agree that your belief system is bound to the Bible. We could look at this particular issue without the Bible. And it is important to be able to do that. But for our purposes today, we are looking at it from a biblical context. Let's look at just a few scriptures. The Bible speaks of the unborn as children. In describing her pregnancy, Rebecca says that the children struggled together within her, referring to the preborn Esau and Jacob. Ruth when she was at her lowest point in conversation with her daughters-in-law who were supportive of her, Ruth said, well, even the sons in my womb, would you wait for the sons in my womb? She didn't call them fetuses. Now, I realize that they didn't have maybe a term for that in Hebrew or didn't have medical knowledge to that degree, but she refers to that which could be in her as sons, it was actually hypothetical. In Luke chapter 1, verse 36, speaking of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. And as Elizabeth and Mary got together 
Elizabeth cried out, For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe, which is unborn, leaped in my womb for joy. That very same term, babe, is used to describe Jesus post-birth, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So the connection is, it's called a babe inside the womb, and it's called a babe outside the womb. Jeremiah gives a testimony that he received from the Lord. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. God speaks of his plans for the unborn. We're not looking at it in detail, but Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, are also very significant biblical comments about the preborn, the unborn. In Genesis 16, 11, in the experience that the Lord had with Hagar, the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. God gives names to the preborn. In John chapter 9, I know that we are really skipping around the scriptures here, and I hope you're able to follow this. In John chapter 9, in which Jesus and the disciples encountered this man who had been born this man who had been blind from birth, the question was asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? And Jesus replies, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So God speaks of one born with a disability as even having the potential to be purposeful for his glory. Many of you are familiar with Nick Vujicic, It was not aware, I don't think his parents were aware of his birth deformities, born without arms, born without legs. But what a ministry Nick Vujicic has had. Has literally spoken to millions of people because of his faith in Jesus and his indomitable spirit to carry on with life in spite of his major major handicaps. So the Bible describes the preborn to be children. They are human beings. God gives life to preborn children. God creates in the womb wonderfully. God gives names to the preborn and he knows their future days. Jesus said that the disabled can bring glory to God. The Bible is decidedly for life, for the preborn. Now, some have looked at various, there's actually two potential passages in the Old Testament as, and it's a stretch, but trying to look at them as some scriptural support for abortion. One passage that is referred to in the literature and in conversation comes from Exodus chapter 21. If men fight and hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according to the woman's husband as imposed upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now this unpacking of consequence in the Old Testament, is known as something as the lex talionis. And it simply describes a consequent that the punishment resembles the offense. So one scholar looking at this comes to this conclusion. If harm or death comes to either mother or the fetus, the lex talionis is to be invoked. Because the fetus is regarded on par with its mother, this passage protects the sanctity of life for the unborn and gives no support whatever for the practice of abortion. The Bible <clears throat> is decidedly for life for the preborn, protecting the preborn. Where is the biblical support that is decidedly pro choice, abortion accommodating? Where is it in the Bible? It's not there. 
And of course, this goes back to one's foundational assumption. What takes precedence? The life of the unborn or the perceived well-being, and in certain cases, even the life of the mother. I would remind ourselves <clears throat> that God at times does allow very sorrowful, tragic things to happen. When Benjamin was born, Rachel died. You remember that in Genesis? We don't know why God allowed that to happen, but he allowed that to happen. We can be assured that at the times in which we live, there will be hatred. There will be lawlessness. And I would be so forthright to state <clears throat> that on the basis of the Bible, in God's perspective, you may not agree with this, that abortion is lawless because it's the taking of a human life in so many instances without purpose and without necessity. Now, some in our community, our Seventh Adventist community, are hesitant to be vocal or they are hesitant to actually affirm those who are pro-life because they see the pro-life movement, the pro-life perspective, as a coalition, a cooperation between conservative Protestants and Catholics. And based upon what we read in prophecy, specifically from Revelation chapter 13, where we see there described a worldwide religious movement that appears to have a diverse base, <clears throat> it is feared that, well, we don't want to go with that because of what we read prophesied in Revelation 13. But personally, don't expect you to take this particular perspective. Personally, I think that we need to stand for life and deal with the future as it becomes reality. We as Seventh-day Adventists uphold the Ten Commandments. And we uphold, and rightly so, that one which is neglected. The fourth commandment that describes the Sabbath, that tells us who our God is, the creators of the heavens and the earth. But have we somewhat unwittingly ignored the sixth commandment while favoring the fourth? There may be a very difficult conversation that takes place at some point in the future for us as Seventh-day Adventists, well, you have been a champion of God's Ten Commandments. Why haven't you upheld the Sixth Commandment as much as you have upheld the Fourth? Have you thought about that in the past? And as I mentioned before, there is a diversity of perspective on this within the Seventh-day Adventist community. Likely a diversity of perspective even in this room. And so what it will come down to is one's own perspective and how one deals with and relates to his or her understanding of the Scriptures. Three current issues that we're looking at today, violence and heartlessness, the Supreme Court's action in regards to abortion, and now the voices of the LGBTQ community. We have just come through the month of June, which is identified as Pride Month, Gay Pride Month. <clears throat> this goes back historically to June of 1969 and the Stonewall Riots in New York City in which gay and lesbian people desiring to socialize and attend certain restaurants and bars were mistreated physically by police. So because of the Stonewall Riots that took place in June, that has a 
contemporary historical foundation for June as Gay Pride Month. <clears throat> it is no secret to all of us that corporate America has by and large adopted, embraced, affirmed the LGBTQ community. This comes from Forbes magazine <clears throat> here just this week. Companies need to keep advocating for LGBTQ plus rights after Pride Month ends. Pride Month brings attention to the difficulties of the LGBTQ plus community that they face all year round. <clears throat> and it's encouraging to see the number of allies and supporters grow each year. According to the Human Rights Campaign, Corporate Equality Index, or CEI, more than 90% of Fortune 500 companies have non-discrimination policies on sexual orientation and gender identity. <clears throat> Moreover, two-thirds have transgender inclusive benefits for employees. In 2022, a record number of CEI-rated businesses offer at least one transgender inclusive plan option with current market standard coverage. Now, I will pause for a moment to say that I affirm civil rights for the LGBT community. I affirm their dignity and their value. But what I cannot affirm is what they will continue to engage in because it is against the creation design that we read in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Same-sex relationships, transgendered, embra the embracing of transgenderism distorts the creation design. And this is the foundation upon which I believe that biblically, one needs to pay attention to. In Romans chapter 1, we read this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, there's an order to creation that tells us that there was a divine intelligence that put this all together. Because all they knew, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Those are difficult words for many in our culture now to read. And it is one, <clears throat> one of what is referred to by some as the clobber texts. The others occurring in the book of Leviticus. My question is, how far will Pride Month go? How far will it go? Thank you very much, Mark. Some of you may be aware of this particular headline that occurred in the news <clears throat> going on a year ago. Alan Walker, a Ph.D., had a publication and a YouTube dialogue in which he states <clears throat> that sexual attraction to children isn't always immoral. And he coined a term there, minor attracted person, because the term pedophile is pejorative. So he's changing the language to put that particular dynamic in a different framework. A minor 
attracted person. It'll be interesting to see <clears throat> what will happen if time lasts 10 to 15 years from now. Because what we think of as being pedophilia has the potential to go away because of the change of perspective, the change of terminology. And yet we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, <laughs> the apostle writes. And we don't need to only focus upon homosexuals and sodomites. We need to be embracive of the whole list there. Idolaters, adulterers, covetous. Those who are covetous. That could be me. It could be you. But Paul says that those who pursue these paths will not inherit the kingdom of God. You were washed, the apostle says. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The Bible presents to us whatever pathway, whatever expression of our depraved, perverted, fallen nature that may be unique to us, that there is a way out of that. It is through the presence and the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Again, <clears throat> there is a range of perspective on this, even within the Seventh-day Adventist community. Not this week that we're just closing, but the week prior. I and my family were in Lexington, Kentucky for the North American Division called Ministerial Convention. <clears throat> it was reported that there were about 6,000 people there. Not 6,000 pastors, but 6,000 in total attendance with spouses and children. And I went to a seminar specifically related to LGBTQ issues. And I was shocked. I was literally shocked at the perspective that was being presented, which was basically to affirm and accommodate same-sex couples and relationships in our churches. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Again, we may not always be able to rely upon our faith community generally to formulate our beliefs and convictions for us. We come down to a very personal, individual conviction on some of these issues. What I ask myself the question is this. <clears throat> Why is it that there is such a seemingly wholesale, broad embrace when we have individuals who have been there in our generation and left. One is Beckett Cook. If you want to take a picture of that website, I invite you to do that. Reported on the Gospel Coalition's website, From Gay to Gospel, the fascinating story of Beckett Cook. I've watched some of his YouTube videos. He left a same-sex lifestyle, a gay orientation, because he understood the call of the gospel in his life. In our own Seventh day Adventist community, there is a ministry that operates independently and yet in an affirming way with our Seventh day Adventist, uh, our Seventh day Adventist, uh, I would say, <laughs> values, at least most of them, called Coming Out Ministries. Again, 
This ministry is led by those who have been in a same-sex lifestyle, a gay lifestyle, a lesbian lifestyle, and have come out because God has called them and convicted them to come out. And by the way, this particular ministry just doesn't deal with LGBTQ issues, also with pornography and adultery as well. As it relates to transgenderism, the story of Walt Hayer. In that website, Sex Change Regret, he tells his story. My name is Walt Hayer, and in April of 1983, I had gender reassignment surgery. At first, I was giddy for the fresh start, but hormones and sex change genital surgery couldn't solve the underlying issues driving my gender dysphoria. I detransitioned, in other words, I went back to male orientation intentionally. 25 years ago, I learned the truth. Hormones and surgery may alter appearances, but nothing changes the immutable fact of your sex. I met a wonderful woman who didn't care about the changes to my body, and we've been married for over 20 years. Now we help others whose lives have been derailed by sex change. And yet this is the current issue in our culture. Same-sex marriage, that's in the rearview mirror. That's back there now. But now transgender issues and what's taking place in some of our schools, this is front and center right now. So three current issues, all in the context of the gospel going forward. And Jesus gives that promise. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Enduring through tribulation and persecution, enduring through hatred, enduring through lawlessness, enduring through love that has gone cold. But how do we endure? How do we endure? Doing a little bit of a word study throughout the New Testament, we find some insights from Colossians chapter 1. May you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. So a knowledge of God's will is vital. Pursuing wisdom and spiritual understanding is vital. Putting that into practice is vital. That you may be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. The power comes from God. It comes from outside of us and is available for us to embrace. For all patience, that's the word endurance. That's the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew 24. For all patience and long-suffering with joy. So we can be fruitful in good works. We increase in knowledge. We find new strength and power from God, and this provides us with endurance. Such is what we find in Colossians chapter 1. Looking at the example and the experience of Jesus from Hebrews chapter 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. There it is, same word. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured, not because he was solely focused upon his current circumstances, but because he looked forward into the future of what his sacrifice would obtain. His example provides us with inspiration that we would lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 24, but that is vitally connected with another passage in the New Testament with which most of us are greatly familiar, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience. The same word is used in the New Testament Greek, endurance, patience. Here is the endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Watch, pray, be ready. Watch, pray, be ready. 
and invite God's presence daily, hourly, minute by minute, to be our strength to endure.